I'm delighted to introduce Professor Mike Shaver from the University of Manchester, who's going to talk about recycling plastics. Hello, Mike. Hi. Uh, hopefully I can share a screen and this will work. So, um, yep, can see that. cool. I, so great to kind of be right at the end because uh, well, it's been a hard year. Uh, it sort of feels like the end of the world, the end of Discover Materials Science Week. Um, and I think what's really important to remember is that the, as a world, we're facing lots and lots of challenges. And what this talk hopefully shows is that some of these challenges are, are related to each other, right? And we have to make sure that when we're trying to tackle one of the major environmental challenges we face, we can't forget about some of those other environmental challenges. And of course, those societal challenges, including our health and the pandemic and how we all work together uh, as individuals. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna talk about plastics today, but from a science standpoint, we call plastics polymers. And so these polymers are long chain materials that really interact with every aspect of our day-to-day -day life. And I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges we face uh, in how we deal with those materials, how they degrade in our environment, how we collect them, and basically how we need to value them more to be able to actually figure out what to do with them. So, um, you know, really championed by David Attenborough, uh, plastics have uh, been recognized as a real global environmental threat, uh, but really they are uh, prolific in terms of how they impact our lives. Uh, this graph here shows how much plastic we have been making. This is just one plastic called polyethylene uh, and how that has dramatically increased since we started to produce that from uh, what was at the time waste petroleum uh, into the, the dominant material we have today. And the biggest concern here is that we seem to be very, very good at making those things. But uh, the bit down at the bottom, the yellow fraction of this, uh, that's actually the material that we have recovered or recycled. And so if we were to think about the area underneath that red curve and just subtract off the area uh, beneath that, well, the rest of that is just waste. So that idea that we keep producing and producing and producing uh, and producing this material and releasing it into the environment is what has caused the massive environmental crisis associated with plastics today. And of course, this isn't just uh, associated with, um, you know, the, the companies are producing it. We are consumers of things. We make decisions as to what we do every single day. And uh, if we had the privilege, oh my gosh, the wonder of being together in person, then I would just ask everybody to raise their hands. You know, if they want to save the world, do you want to raise your hand uh, when you're using a styrofoam cup to drink your beverage out of, or would you raise your hand for the ceramic mug? Uh, and invariably, every single time I've ever given this talk all over the world, uh, everyone says, oh, the ceramic mug, we're going we're to save the world by drinking our beverages out of the ceramic mug. But uh, if you were carefully looking at the video, you saw that I raised my hand for the styrofoam cup. Well, why would I do that when I care so passionately about the environment? Well, I want you to think about energy here because energy and its associated tie in with our carbon footprint and our increasing uh, concerns about climate change is actually really important. And if I look at the energy I have to use to be able to make these two materials, they're starkly different. So for that styrofoam cup, I can make, transport, use, and dispose of over 500 styrofoam cups for the energetic cost of one ceramic mug. Because for that mug, I've got to go and I've got to dig up my clay. I've got to refine my clay. I've got to heat a kiln up to a very high temperature. I've got to make that clay and then paint it to ensure that I have the finish that I want. And that mug is heavy. And so when I transport it to a grocery store, let's go for Sainsbury's and that ends up in Sainsbury's. Well, that's cost a certain amount to transport that to Sainsbury's. And then you're gonna pick it up from Sainsbury's and drive it home potentially, or maybe it'll get delivered. All of those energetic costs are more significant because the cup is more energetic to produce and more energetic to transport. Now, many of you would say, oh, well, wait, 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 right? 
Well, the styrofoam cup, I would never reuse it, but the ceramic mug I'm going to reuse, right? And so by reusing that mug every single time, then I can save energy because I'm not making a new thing. But the challenge is we would have to say, well, do you want to wash that mug? Because if you use hot water and you use detergent, well, you've got to make the detergent, you've got to heat the water up and you've got to clean the water afterwards. And that's the energetic cost of about two styrofoam cups. And so plastic is a remarkable material, both because of its properties, but also because it is exceptionally low carbon. It's exceptionally easy to make. And so the only way to do this is when you guys eventually end up at university somewhere and you look in professor's offices, well, you'll see an unwashed tea or coffee mug that has never uh, actually seen the back end of a sink at all. And that's because inherently all of us professors are both gross and inherently sustainable. But beyond the jokes, really what matters here is that not only do we have a tie-in to all of our uh, energetic crises that we're facing, but also how intimately those are related to our economy. Because the price of everything actually correlates with the price of energy. So if crude oil goes up, the cost of our plastics go up, the cost of our food goes up, everything is tied to our use of energy. And so this means that we really have to care both for economic reasons and for environmental reasons about how much energy we are using. And I just wanna give you a very non-polymer example, right? For those of you who have done a little bit of chemistry in school, I wanna talk about a chemical called ammonia. Now ammonia is the most produced chemical on earth. It's got a very simple equation. I take a little bit of nitrogen gas and a little bit more of hydrogen gas and I combine those together. But the way I need to do that is exceptionally complex. So the conditions here matter. And what's interesting is I have an entirely what we call atom economic process. Every single atom from my starting point ends up in my product. So this looks great, no waste at all. But the concern about this specific reaction all comes down to energy. So this is an ammonia plant that's based in the US, I think, it's either the US or China, I can't remember which picture I chose. But if I look at ammonia as a system in general, 80% of the ammonia is used for a very good purpose, right? 80% is used to make fertilizers, to help us make more food, to feed our ever increasing population. So we need to use ammonia. There's a really good justification for using it in order to grow food so that people don't go hungry. We actually make 164 million tons of ammonia each year. And if we look at that chemical and petrochemical sector, it's actually the largest global energy consumer. But if I take all of that energy, ammonia is responsible for a full 17% of energy consumption. And that's even though there is not a single carbon atom in that actual product. So this is only energetic consumption because it's very difficult to make this material. Now I only had numbers up to 2004, it's much bigger now. But in 2004, ammonia production used 5.6 exojoules of fossil fuels. I don't even know what that means, but it's 5.6 quintillion joules of energy or a billion barrels of oil. So if we think about that energy consumption and the oil we're using and the whole petrochemical sector, we have a major challenge because a single chemical we're making uses up a billion barrels of oil. And so we have to take these energetic considerations into account whenever we're making decisions about plastics. So what do we do? Well, the problem is that we have all of this plastic in our system and because we don't value that as a material, because we deem it to be waste, we end up producing more of it instead of trying to circularize it and that then doesn't decompose over thousands of years. And so because we do not take care of this material at the end of life, we now have a big problem with waste. So if we look at where we see plastics, we can actually get more information in terms of its value and therefore what we should be doing with it at end of life. So one of the things that people like to blame uh, the plastics industry for is packaging. But if I were to look at packaging, the actual mass of packaging, if I wanted to use an alternative material, would quadruple. 
If I were to look at food spoilage, so how much food waste can I reduce? I would double food spoilage if I didn't have plastics. And that's both the plastics that are in your grocery stores protecting your food, but also the stuff that you would uh, use at home to protect your leftovers. My vehicles would be heavier, so I'd increase petrol costs, and I wouldn't have modern insulation. And so my homes would stay uh, hot in the summer and stay cold in the winter because I wasn't using this plastic. And if you look at all of those energetic gains, it's not as much as that ammonia example, but it's still really significant. So plastics, if we were to simply replace them with alternative materials, are estimated to save about 583 million gigajoules of energy per year. So that's about a million, hundred million barrels of oil, right? And so we think about that, some of these pitches uh, around, oh, we wanna have a zero plastic world, right? That's not to say we don't wanna reduce plastic, but a zero plastic world. Well, that would mean that we have to somehow get a carbon footprint of 433 billion kilograms of CO2 less, right? Because now we are using alternative materials and that's the amount that plastics are saving. So the challenge here is that you have lots of people who are extremely uh, excited uh, and advocates for a carbon neutral future, and they can't recognize that plastics are actually pay, playing a really important part to reducing our carbon footprint and meeting those targets. So this is Extinction Rebellion. Uh, many of you who might be climate activists might recognize them as a group but, uh, in the UK, certainly, and really growing around the world. Uh, very strong climate uh, activists. So I've actually talked to them about it. And it's really neat because once you get to teach them about the materials, it becomes apparent and they really buy into using plastics, but using them in the right way. But the other thing from an external perspective is that everybody thinks about those packages, but they don't realize the complexity of the polymeric world around them because there's plastics in fabrics, there's plastics in PPE, there's plastic in footwear, in electronics, and even in the adhesive that is attaching this guy's hand to the wall of the London Stock Exchange. So the diversity of plastics make it especially hard to do anything with it at end of life. So if we just look at what seems like a simple example, we can get another sense of this complexity. So if I look at a package of meat, right, and that could be meat or that could be uh, meat alternative, right? Anything that we want to package up in the grocery store. Well, the reason that that is there, the plastic is there for two big reasons, right? One is to increase the shelf life of that material. And one is to ensure that we're meeting food safety standards. So we want to have the shelf life of the material to prevent food waste, to lower our carbon footprint. And we want to have food safety standards to prevent people from getting sick and dying. Those are great things. There are lots of things within a grocery store, however, which really aren't necessary. It's much more difficult to treat a black piece of packaging at end of life than it is a white piece of packaging. But the only reason that this black package is there is because the meat looks sexier, right? And so the marketing people have figured out you can sell it for more money and make more profit because that's on a black package. Well, that's great. So in any setting, what we do uh, from a research perspective is work with companies to identify the bits of their plastic universe, which are really important to retain and which bits they can actually do without. So that's a big part of moving forward into the future. But what's really important is actually to understand the complexity, even in just this single item, right? So if I look at this package, I'm going to have a plastic tray or a plastic reinforced paper tray. The film that's associated with this looks like it's just one thing, right? That stretchy cling film type material. Actually, it's five different layers usually, each a micron thick, that each form a different function in the system. I then have another polymer that's actually attaching my film to my tray, a polymer that's going to make my label shiny, a polymer that's going to adhere my label to my plastic package. And then underneath the meat, you might sometimes see this absorbent plastic mesh that soaked up the meat juice to prevent it from going all over the place in the container. So that complexity means that I don't just have one potential end of life for those materials. I need to have a different end of life for all of those different components, making the system of recycling exceptionally complex. And of course, what I need to do is to not say, oh, well, this is my new fancy thing. You guys should go and do whatever you want with it. 
I have to understand how society actually interacts with those materials. Because I could get someone to rinse their tray and put it in their recycling bin, but there's absolutely no way I'm going to get someone to rinse out a meat soaked uh, gross plastic mesh and put it in the recycling bin, right? So the end of life has to be dictated by practice, not our wishful thinking as material scientists. <clears throat> and of course, we've now faced a much more diverse plastic universe in this year of a pandemic. And so why do we have plastics in hospitals? Why do we see this proliferation of plastics in safety gear? Well, because plastics are essential in preventing infection providing consistency of delivery. They're very easy to sterilize. Those are fantastic things. We need to keep doing them. Should we have plastic cups in, uh, in hospitals? Should we have excesses in our surgical kits? Should we have people disposing of PPE like face masks in the street? Obviously not. So we also do some work with the NHS and looking at what flows within a hospital might be able to be reduced to eliminate plastic waste but what bits of their plastic life cycle they absolutely need to retain. But one of the big challenges we're also facing is that just because something is the best thing to do doesn't necessarily mean that everybody who is selling you products believes that. Uh, so this is a product, uh, baby wipes, right? So it used to be that we could uh, wipe our bottoms with toilet paper, uh, no more. We've got to have wipes for various activities. These baby wipes, I think, are especially important uh, just to ensure that we're getting cleanliness there. But the problem isn't the baby wipe itself. It's the fact that it's marketed as 100% biodegradable and down here, really small, 0% plastic, right? Well, in fact, this material is made out of polylactic acid. It is made of plastic, but it's a bio-derived plastic. And unfortunately, this specific bio-derived plastic degrades in an industrial biodegradation system where people would dispose of it, such as in your uh, bin, in your bathroom, or potentially, please don't do this, flushing it down the toilet, it does not bi biodegrade in either of those environments. And so it is marketed as biodegradable, but in fact, these act as the wild ties and fat birds and are very damaging for our sewer systems. So just because something says that it has a biodegradation to it doesn't actually mean that it degrades in the environment of release. And the challenge here is that it changes practice. So people would normally not throw something, a piece of plastic that was listed as non-biodegradable down the toilet, but now people are changing their practice and disposing of things in different ways, even though they um, uh, think that they're doing the right thing. So the challenge is, is that we have all of this waste around us. And in fact, the big issue is that we don't make, uh, we don't retain the value of this resource. We don't do anything near enough to actually promote the recovery or transformation of this into new products. And so this comes back to the importance of treating this material carefully at end of life. Now, this means that we need to look at sustainable materials. Now, sustainable is a word that is just increasing and increasing in use. This is a comic from XKCD. If you haven't engaged in that as a comic, I thoroughly recommend you do so. Uh, but this really looks at the proliferation of this word sustainable. And lots of people think that this means lots of different things. What I'm talking about here is very much environmental sustainability. How can we make sure that the products that we are producing don't negatively impact our future selves, future generations? So what does the sustainable material look like? Well, well, the first thing we have to do is recognize that these plastics and these polymers hold massive societal value. If we do away with them, we will have people get sick and die. We will increase our carbon footprint. We can't do that uh, and try and have a climate secure future. We also have to recognize that these plastics are very diverse and we have to think about them as individual components instead of saying, well, everything should be treated in the exact same way. And that's because we have various different fates that we can think of for these materials themselves. So the big one, the most important is being able to reuse materials, right? Because if we reuse materials, we then don't have to go and produce a new one. We're just keeping that in the same cycle very important. 
If we can't reuse it, and there's lots of good reasons why you can't, then you should prioritize recycling. And that could be, as we do in the UK, mechanical recycling, or it could be something new like enzymatic or chemical recycling. If we can't do that, then we should be degrading those things in the environment. And it's really important, degradation is coming after recycling. So biodegradation is not a panacea, it's not a cure for all of our plastic woes. And if we can't do any of that, then that's the only time we should really consider pyrolysis and certainly energy from waste. There's major issues with our obsession with incinerating away our waste problems. And so this really highlights that the idea of a plastic free world is very dangerous. And instead we need to have a world that recovers value and values these plastic materials. So stop calling them waste and start thinking of them as a resource. And so this means instead of saying we're getting a sustainable plastic from some magical resource, there is no sustainable plastic. It's only a sustainable system. So we have to think about how that material exists all throughout its life to be able to know what best to do with it. <clears throat> and this is really coming down to the point around what types of terms that we use. So oftentimes we'll go and look at a package and say, oh, this is recyclable, or this is compostable, or this is biodegradable. Well, it doesn't really matter if it's any of those things. It only matters if we start using past tense terminology. So how do we ensure the materials are actually recycled or composted or biodegraded? That's what matters. So we've started to do this at the University of Manchester through a project which is called One Bin to Rule Them All. So those of you who are Lord of the Rings fans, this is a purposeful joke uh, on the one ring. And it basically is the idea that if we were to try and simplify the waste management infrastructure, what could we gain by recycling things and recovering value in a very different way? And so to do that, we've done a little short video, which hopefully you can hear. When you hear the term plastic recycling, do you know which plastics are actually recyclable and which aren't? Come to think of it, do you know which plastics can be recycled full stop? In the UK, there are 39 different household bin collection regimes across 391 local authorities. For example, you can recycle a plastic bottle in one local authority, but not a plastic tub. Yet in another authority, you can recycle that plastic tub. And it's not just domestic recycling that's confusing, but disposing of it when we're out and about too. But what if there was one bin that could simplify the whole plastic waste system? A single bin for all plastics. For the consumer, it would be incredibly simple. One bin to rule them all. This project aims to simplify the whole system eliminate the plastic released into the environment and prevent it ending up in landfill or the incinerator. Instead, the value of plastic will be recovered by determining the best pathway for it once it enters the waste infrastructure. The public disposes of their plastics into one bin, where it is then sorted. This can be done using a new marking system added to the plastic at the point of manufacture, either by printing a small code on the plastic, which cannot be seen with the naked eye, or by embedding it into the molecular structure. Both of these methods can be detected using spectroscopic techniques. The markings are used to sort plastics into bins for reuse, mechanical or chemical recycling. Choosing the best fate rather than simply mixing the same plastics together. By working to develop solutions with everyone in the plastic supply chain, from manufacturers and brand owners, to local waste management, all points of the chain can share the value of these recovered plastics. The one bin for all plastics brings together a focus on materials, business models, and social practices to create a holistic solution to tackling plastic waste. So if that's not cheesy enough for you on a Friday afternoon, uh, and if you're not a Lord of the Rings fan, then, um, well, sorry to put you through that, but we like it a lot. 
Uh, so I just want to dive into a little bit of uh, the specifics in terms of where some of those challenges lie. So if we look at one of the plastics that uh, probably all of you have interacted with, this is called polyethylene terephthalate or PET. So if you've seen a PET bottle, those are the bottles you would normally see a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi or a water in. And I look at that material, well, it's actually really a, a great case study in terms of the things that we should do. So uh, for those of you who have a little bit of a chemistry focus, this is the chemical structure of polyethylene terephthalate. And I refer to this N as sort of the number of repeat units. So anytime I have a polymer, I've got a really long chain of molecules and it's that long chain that really gives it the properties that it has. And similar to uh, why I would wanna choose a plastic bottle. Well, if I look at my carbon footprint of my plastic bottle, it's about 245 grams of CO2 uh, versus 675 grams of CO2 for a traditional glass bottle, right? So plastic is really good once again, because of its carbon footprint. Now, what do I wanna do with that material? Well, PET actually is extremely good because it's the most recycled polymer on the planet. So most of the plastics that you would see uh, within your packaging infrastructure for sure are PET, polyethylene, polystyrene, polyvinyl chloride, and polypropylene. Now you can recycle all of these, but PET is by far the most recycled. And that's actually because it's the easiest to recycle. So it does the best job at actually retaining those properties. But the problem here is the actual volumes associated with it. And recycling is actually really low. So globally, this is only about 16%. And even in the EU, this is only at 32%. So even though we have all these materials, we're simply not retaining them as well as we should. So most of it goes to landfill or energy recovery, and that's just not good enough. And the problem here is sorting. It's really difficult to sort all of these different materials from each other. And even for something like PET, there's lots of different kinds of PET. And I wanna be able to sort much more detail to be able to keep things in their highest value form. Now I do this by actually doing quite a lot of mechanical work in our lab. And so we use an extruder to actually test what happens during the recycling process. And so this is just a model of an extruder that we would be using. And you can take a whole bunch of mixed plastic waste and feed it in through this extruder uh, out through a dye and make new plastic particles or in fact blown films out of those materials. But if I look at some of the material performance, well, something like tensile strength. So this is how much can I pull it before it breaks? You can see why that would be important for something like a bottle. You don't wanna pick that up off of the shelf and have that break apart in your hand. So the strength of those materials is really important. But the more times I recycle it, the worse that system gets. And so the challenge with mechanical recycling is to choose that feedstock and make it really, really pure so I can avoid the degradation I see, which is arising from contaminants and the forces associated with this extrusion system. So how do you know what to do? What's best at the end of life? What makes a polymer sustainable? This is the real challenge that we're associated with in our Sustainable Materials Innovation Hub. And in fact, what we do is to say the only way that this is gonna happen is by working directly with industry to try and solve these problems. And so what we have is this one bin project where we look at various different waste markers to sort things on the fly from your home recycling bin to be able to prioritize things for reuse. And so that involves making more robust materials that can be reused, mechanical recycling to track not only the mechanical recycling, but how many times we've recycled it. And when we've lost the performance there, we can shift it to something called chemical recycling that actually breaks this down and makes new virgin feedstock to give us new plastic that has the same properties as stuff straight from petroleum. So all of this is focused on removing the release of plastic from the environment, right? So that's the goal. You wanna be able to retain value from those systems. And actually because we're retaining that value, you lower the amount of petroleum you have to dig out of the ground in order to make new plastic. This is the whole point of the circular economy. Keep things in the loop to prevent a reliance on new natural resources. A lot of this has to do with nothing to do with material science. And so one of the things I wanted to say today is if you're interested in materials, it's really important to understand how other disciplines can help you make better decisions. So we work a lot with economists and we work a lot with social scientists 
because it's really important for us to understand how our materials are gonna be used. And it's really important for us to understand how our innovations are gonna make those businesses money. Because if we don't have something that is economically sustainable, then businesses won't adopt it and we won't see change happen. So we need to have solutions that are driven by environmental sustainability, but are socially and economically responsible as well. So that's uh, about it in terms of what I wanted to talk to you about. I wanna reiterate the focus of our group is on ensuring that these materials are recycled, composted and biodegraded. And we do this through a new center at the University of Manchester, which is called the Sustainable Materials Innovation Hub. We're actually supposed to have moved into this already, but I'm still stuck in my living room uh, because we're still in the midst of a pandemic, but we should be opening uh, in July of this year. Uh, although we've started some uh, work on this already. So we work with a lot of industry partners uh, to try and make these sustainable changes happen. Uh, so thanks a lot uh, for listening and I'm happy to take any and all questions about plastics and recycling and how we can make the world better. Oh, thanks very much, Mike. That was absolutely fascinating. And um, what I thought was really interesting was um, what you were sort of talking about the language used and using the past tense a lot more. Um, using sort of terms recycled and actually fortuitously enough I found a bit of packaging at home yesterday that says recycled on it and recyclable so it's it's sort of quite it's good for the consumer to know where it's come from and then that can help put the pressure on to buy that yeah for sure and I think that's the that's the big challenge is like the the most common label uh, is uh, from an organization called OPRL and they're doing lots of good work but that'll say widely recycled, right? Mm. So widely recycled actually just means that it's collected. It doesn't, you don't actually know in your home, right? In your bin, whether or not that actually is gonna be recycled or whether that could go to landfill or uh, is incinerated. And that's the challenge is how do we, with such inconsistent bin collections across the UK, get the message across or to have control over what actually is Recycle, And so we do a lot of policy work to advise the government to try and get the, that consistency up. I mean, when I moved to Manchester, uh, we rented a place and then I literally moved one mile away, but I, I suddenly had different colored bins and different things I was allowed to put into those bins. And I'm a plastics guy and I found it confusing. Someone who's not a plastics person, they're going to get confused, they're going to make mistakes and then the mistakes have a consequence on the quality of the stuff that we can recycle. Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, there's a question in the comments. Uh, can you see the comments? Yeah. Uh, so you're, uh, I work for a steel project, and there's a surprising amount of similarities. Uh, absolutely, yeah. So steel is another thing where control over feedstock is what gives you the quality during the recycling process. Um, the uh, Embedded code, uh, I, I'm gonna guess steel probably would incinerate the small molecular codes that we use, uh, slightly harsher conditions than plastic recycling. Uh, I think there's a lot of push towards these molecular markers. How you would do that in steel, I'm not sure. That's beyond my uh, sustainable materials scout, uh, but it's there absolutely should be a way to identify that. With something that's perhaps a little bit more precious like steel, there's been a lot of work on actually blockchaining those materials. So you have, and as long as that's not too many calculations to make that energetic cost not smart, there's, there's ways to perhaps think about tracking those individual items so you have more progeny over where they came from. So a printed code might be better. Uh, but yeah, um, talking of sort of energetics, um, uh, in our event, winter event last uh, uh, over winter, surprisingly enough, we had um, a video from a group at Birmingham who do um, catalytic degradation of polycarbonates from old CDs, and then use that as a resin for microsterial lithography and making new parts. So, just sort of thinking in energy terms, whether that whether this reuse of whether the, the chopping down of polymers into their monomers and reusing that, whether that's generally energetically good or not yeah so if you were to uh i'm gonna guess that's andrew dove's group How do you yeah 
Uh, so so uh, we have a number of collaborations on things. So if you were to look at the energetics of mechanical recycling versus chemical recycling, chemical recycling is more energetically intense, yeah. right? But if you were to think about a CD, well, a CD is not just polycarbonate. You've got mm. lots of other bits within that polycarbonate. And so what's fascinating about chemical recycling is you can take what I would call a multi-material. So you've got lots of different laminated layers and inks and weird stuff. If you break that, that down, you're only touching the plastic bit that actually holds the value. And so you're able to circularize things that you would never be able to circularize before because you can have selectivity. So where you, where you see chemical recycling's focus is on those bits where you can transform something that's complex into something that's more simple. And then the, then the energy is justifiable. Uh, yeah, because I mean, that's it. We've sort of like, in the sort of theme through this week is that sort of circular economy and the material science and engineering. It's just so multifaceted, and, which I suppose is why you, Got a lot of people can get lost and not really sure where to go in it, but it's just um... and it's it's a big problem for government, right? Because government mm. wants simple policies that apply for all materials, right? Mm. And the our material landscape is exceptionally complex, and it simply is there is no panacea that is going to solve all of your problems. You've got to have complicated solutions for what is a complicated uh, issue. Yeah. And it's also sort of, yeah, you know, it's not the material itself, it's how, how it's used as well, isn't it? And processed, and there's just so much to it, and the language as we touched upon earlier. And, and the diversity of uses. I mean, you've, like, uh, I talked to, we do some work with a, a recycler in Greater Manchester, right? And so you take an old plastic milk jug, right? So that's made of HDPE, you can eminently take that milk jug and make it into a new milk jug works really, really well. But you'll have someone, right, who says, well, I'm going to do an environmentally conscious thing and I'm going to refill, I'm going to reuse that milk jug for something else, right? Um, you know, for me, I sometimes go to the pub that I'm not allowed in anymore and they'll <laughs> fill my milk jug up with Cascale and I'll get to, on a Friday evening in an hour and uh, 23 minutes, have uh, a beer, this sounds great, but someone else might go, well, I've got this old motor oil, right? So I'm changing the oil in my car and I'm gonna put my spent motor oil into that container, right? Well, and, and eventually they might go and take that, that container that now has the film of motor oil into the recycling bin. Well, that motor oil is basically the same chemical composition or very close to the same chemical composition as my plastic bottle, but it's all these little tiny short chains instead of a big long chain. You have now, by recycling that, destroyed hundreds of thousands of milk bottles, right? Mm -hmm. Because the damage that those small molecules can do to the system. So everything has to go through these extensive washing steps to make sure we don't have contaminants because we can't have those contaminants destroy the recycling infrastructure that we've built up. So even something like that where practice gives us a big difference in what kind of contaminants we would see has a consequence on um, what we're doing as material scientists to recover value from. Yeah, it's awesome. Oh, there's a question in the Q&A. Um, how come some plastics can be recycled and some can't? Uh, it's an interesting one because uh, I think all plastics can be recycled if they are thermoplastics. Uh, the only ones that really can't are uh, what are called thermosets or resins. So uh, think of that as being something you would see in like a big wind turbine blade or a car. So those are formulated in different ways where they're sort of locked together and you can't pull those apart. So anything that we call a thermoplastic or a plastic material, those technically can be recycled. The issue is actually one of the supply chain. So how do we segregate all of those materials? Do we have enough of those materials? Can we separate the individual components out to be able to do it? And so a local council has to make a decision as to what is economically feasible 
based on the relationship they have with the waste management company. And so the things that are recycled are not the things that are technically recyclable, but the things which have a profit associated mm. with them. And that I think is the problem is there is a view that something like PVC, so your window frames or your billboard banners or your flooring isn't recyclable, but it is actually there's an excellent company in Greater Manchester that does it, right? But we think that that's not recyclable because the council doesn't pick it up, but the council doesn't pick it up because they would lose money and they're already stretched. Mm. So that it's, it's that tie in between economics um, and uh, the reality of the materials. Now, PVC is more difficult to recycle than PETs. So the one that we recycle most frequently is the one that's technically easiest. Oh, I see. Yeah, so I suppose, I suppose yeah, with plastics recycling, it's almost sort of hang on to it before burning it because at some point it might be economically viable to recycle, I suppose. Well, so it's uh, not necessarily. I mean, sometimes it's uh, if we we are in a I mean, we need to the UK needs to uh, dramatically invest in its waste management infrastructure. But if you look at the global situation and countries which are facing much more damaging environmental crises, right, you don't have that waste management infrastructure at all. So the, the worst thing we do in the UK is to export our plastic waste. Right. So we put it on a boat which takes energy itself and sends it to send it to Malaysia, right? And then we say, oh, Malaysia, you go and deal with that. But they don't have any waste man management infrastructure. And so you're offloading those decisions. So every, every time you go to a different environment, you have a different waste management infrastructure, a different social culture, and therefore a different potential fate for those materials. And you've got to make the right decision based on the waste management infrastructure that you have and that means that our government needs to invest in the right waste management infrastructure and the concern is that they seem to like burning things <laughs> yeah it's a shame but yeah um so i think there's any more questions now oh yep yeah. one just popped up in the chat can people have an impact on changing the system including the waste management infrastructure it's it's uh, it's really interesting. So I think that um, that one of the things we've been working on is to try and talk to advocacy groups that have been promoting a zero plastics message uh, and trying to get them to talk about zero plastics release, right? To recognize the importance of those plastics and circulating them. The challenge is is that if you were to look at so if, if I were to say, okay, I've got a bunch of plastic and I want to recycle it, I don't see much of a difference in the quality of that plastic if I have 70% of the people doing the right thing or 90% of the people doing the right thing. That little bit of impurity is always going to screw with my system. If, however, I get up to like 98% of everybody doing the right thing, right, now I suddenly can get much higher quality product. And so our view is that unfortunately, there's always a certain set of the population who suck and don't care about the environment. And we're never gonna get that number of people to do the right thing. So we're designing the system to deal with the fact that people are gonna do the wrong thing. And so yes, an individual right now, because we haven't done things, you need to know what you're recycling and why you're recycling it. You need to advocate for investment in waste management infrastructure. You need to campaign for uh, zero plastic release and not zero plastic, right? Um, but we need to get institutional change, which is why most of our work is to try and get industry to change their practice and to get government to come up with non-dumb policy, which actually is, the second one is harder. Uh, industry, industry really does want to change and our partners are really making some big strides. It's just making sure the government doesn't get in our way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. Well, that's, yeah, brings us to the end of the session. Thank you so much for that fascinating talk and the questions, Mike, it's been great.